Welcome to Module 6, uh, Global Television Formats. In Module 6, we take a look at the complex process of content reformatting within the broader realm of international distribution and specifically the import-export of media products. In its simplest terms, uh, format is defined as style and or content of a television program such as a variety show, talk show, or game show. And this definition brings format very close to the definition of genre. Formats, however, and more specifically the idea of content reformatting, have been used in global media studies to look at the possibilities of localization once a program is imported in a new country and is modified for the new target audience. So after we explore a few definitions, we will delve into discussion of global and local content and we will look at some examples that clarify how domestication functions within national media industries and their practices. Formats have largely been studied in terms of their economic and industrial use value. Albert Moran, the first scholar to consider, study and define formats as a global programming unity, defined a television format as a set on invariable elements in a serial program out of which the variable elements of individual episodes are produced. Now, unlike a finished or canned television program, format is an easily replicated and adaptable framework licensed through the international television market for local adaptation. In its most basic and legally sanctioned form, it is a program concept, a list of rules or conventions that make up the fixed and distinct aspects of each program. Formats offer tested, rating proven global hit formula with locally produced credentials. But what does this mean in practical terms? Well, it means that formats are convenient in two ways. First of all, they are generally cheap to import by paying a fairly small license fee and produce, because they usually do not require big productions with high budgets. Secondly, since formats count as national productions, countries whose media industries have limitations in the amount of foreign content that can be aired, formats represent a tricky loophole. It's foreign because the concept is imported, but through adaptation, the new format is made local and therefore can be aired as national content. The idea of content reformatting is based on a famous concept that originated in the field of economics. Coined by Ronald Robertson, the idea of localization in its business sense is closely related to what in some contexts is called, in more straightforwardly economic terms, micromarketing, which is the tailoring and advertising of goods and services on a global, global or near global basis to increasingly differentiated local and particular markets. So if we look at Coca-Cola as an example, we can consider how, while the famous beverage is known and recognized internationally, the company's global marketing is still based on the localization of its products, as you can see in this example. So oftentimes, uh, uh, Coca-Cola is adapted to local um, countries, either through language or through, for example, the um, representation of specific events like the World Cup in the last photo. McDonald's, another global brand, offers further examples of localization through adaptation in its food offerings worldwide. In Morocco, McDonald's offer a pita-looking dish called kofta, in Italy, the company relies on organically grown and locally certified beef. In India, where the majority of people are vegetarians, McDonald's does not sell any beef but offers instead a mac paneer, which is basically a fried cheese sandwich. Media industries function very similarly to brands such as Coca-Cola and McDonald's, so TV executives understand the importance of localizing their products to attract a wider audience that can resonate with that content. Now, one of the basic characteristics of the film industry, as of all capitalist industries, is the constant tension 
between the necessity for standardization to increase profitability, on the one hand, and on the other, the need for differentiation. And I'm quoting here Jeanette vincent in her Hollywood Babel article. An example of this tendency is offered by America Rodriguez, who discusses how, previous to the mid-1980s, the Hispanic population was configured as three major markets, Puerto Rican in the eastern United States, Cuban in South Florida, and Mexican in the Southwest. Advertising agencies, accordingly, produced three separate Spanish-language advertising campaigns to target those specific and ethnically diverse viewers. If you want to read more about this, I posted a link to a uh, the Museum of TV Online where America Rodriguez discusses the um, elements of Latino television in the United States. So you can read more about it uh, if you click on the link in your script. So similarly to what Jeanette Vincent Doe argued about Hollywood, Global television formats, more than any other model of media globalization, contain the core paradox of globalization's relation to intense localization and the tension between homogenization and difference involved in economic and cultural globalization processes. Communication scholar Mili Buonanno has defined this process as the paradigm of indigenization and has argued that every kind of content or stylistic reformatting allows for forms of narrative appropriation by the countries importing American products. Adding her contribution to the criticism against the cultural imperialist thesis, which we have discussed uh, earlier on in class, Buonanno champions indigenization as a form of domestication and defines it as the process by which foreign cultural expressions are re-elaborated, appropriated, and finally transformed into new local cultural forms characterized by domestic specificities. Now, matters of localization and domestication are not simply theoretical concepts within global media studies. When I was writing my dissertation at UCLA, I had a chance to interview Marion Edwards, who at the time was the executive vice president for Fox International Television. She told me that exportability greatly influences the choice of a script over another by a network that eventually decides to produce it. In fact, exportability is the number one factor considered by TV executives when deciding to produce any new show. This means that a network will decide to produce a new show only if it has good chances to be exported abroad, either in its original format or in some kind of adaptation. The format can be thought of as a recipe, a kit, or a blueprint, yet format is not a tangible product. Rather, it is a technology of economic and cultural exchange and a service that facilitates certain televisual possibilities. This perspective, predictably, promotes an understanding of formats as a globally distributed container for locally produced content. The commodity known as the format package includes not only a licensing agreement, but also a wealth of documentation known as, in the trade, as the Bible. So whenever a media industry, um, a foreign media industry buys a, a format or the licensing for that format, a whole package is given to um, that network. And in the industry, it's called the Bible. So the Bible includes previous local iteration, production notes and history, often including graphic design elements, character notations, musical themes and cues, staging information and other pro production detail, and information about ratings and target audience. Certain packages also include audiovisual materials and on-site consultation services. In this respect, then, the format can also be considered as a cookie cutter 
if the new adapted program presents new flavor based on local content, but still looks fairly the same because it relies on the production material provided by the original creators. And you can think of, for example, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, for example, uh, which sort of looks the same in all country, even if, of course, the host and the contestants um, are nationals from each different country. And the questions, of course, are based on um, either the history of the, or the culture of that country. But overall, um, Who Wants to Be the Millionaire looks pretty much the same, and that's why I thought of the metaphor of the cookie cutter. The popularity of formats is more than just another trend in an industry perennial hungry for hit shows and eager to follow them. It reveals two developments in contemporary television. The globalization of the business model of television and the efforts of international and domestic companies to deal with the resilience of national culture. Which is why I find the study of formats and reformatting practices particularly interesting to understand the negotiations at play between global and local forces in international media distribution. And in order to understand these negotiations, we have of course to spend a few words about the audiences that receive these programs. Many studies have been developed with the aid of empirical data about audience reception that help um, understand viewers' behaviors when watching imported programs, be they original or adapted and reformatted. Global audiences' responses to these televisual texts uh, present new sites of investigation, offering formatted programs as cultural arenas, where tensions among local, regional, national, and global identities are articulated and experienced in new and intermediated ways. This form of reception and negotiation has been happening for decades, even if global television programs are often described as a new phenomenon, an innovative form of television formal exchange, which represents a break from established or traditional processes of television globalization. Popular programming formula, however, were routinely adapted, franchised, bought, mimicked, and stolen for production in multiple localities worldwide. Yet the trade of circulation of formats has seen an unprecedented growth in the past two decades, rising to dominance as a new industrial globalization mode. It is also that now different media industries uh, don't steal formats anymore, but they actually buy um, the proper license, which means that the industry of formats has been regulated more in the last two decades at least. Within the USA, formats present in the TV schedule went mostly unacknowledged until the massive and unanticipated popularity of several European devised hits and the ensuing focus on formats, and specifically unscripted programming as counter-strategy during the Writers Guild strike of 2007 and 2008. So in the following slides, I'd like to list a few examples of shows uh, based on international foreign formats. Players like Israel, Colombia, and the Netherlands, to name a few prominent examples, are reaping the benefits as audiences across Asia, Africa, Eastern and Western Europe, the US, and more and more enjoy local renditions of shows like Homeland, Ugly Betty, Big Brother, and a few more. So I want to um, start with um, showing you an example from Homeland. Homeland is an American political thriller television series developed by Howard Gordon and Alex Ganza based on the Israeli series Hatufim. Now, in October 2012, the Lebanese government was reportedly planning to sue the show's producer, asserting misrepresentation of Hamra Street in Beirut, Lebanon. Specifically, in the second episode of the second season, uh, titled Beirut is Back, the street was shown as a narrow alleyway with militia roaming and associated with terrorist activity. In reality, 
The Lebanese government uh, says it is a bustling modern hub of cafes and bars. So um, misrepresentation on American television is, is nothing new, but in the case of actual representation uh, of countries, um, oftentimes these problematic depictions can offend um, audiences uh, from those countries. Um, if you go in your um, script, uh, you can see how I posted links to um, How to Fame's uh, pilot episode and also the uh, a link to Homeland pilot episode. So you can sort of watch it in tandem, even if, um, of course, How to Fame is in Hebrew. I also posted links to the Dutch version of Big Brother and you can see the entire pilot episode of Ugly Betty uh, also through the links that I posted on the script. Going back to our lecture, the second example I want to show you is Big Brother. Big Brother is a reality game show franchise created by John de Mole and was originally based on a show from the Netherlands of the same name. The premise of the show is that there is a group of people, dubbed as housemates or house guests, living together in a specially constructed large house. During their time in the house, they are isolated from the outside world and are not commonly aware of outside events. And of course, you should be familiar with the American version of Big Brother in the US. Who wants to be a millionaire, sometimes informally called millionaire? is an American television quiz show based upon the British program of the same title. Now, the case of Slumdog Millionaire is an interesting one, especially when it comes to the study of audiences, since the film received mixed reviews in India about the misrepresentation of the country and its slums. And finally, I want to focus on the case study discussed by Juan Piñon in his article on Ugly Betty. Ugly Betty is an American dramedy developed by Silvio Orta. The series revolves around the character Betty Suarez and is based on Fernando Gaitan's Colombian telenovela soap opera Yo Soy Betty La Fea. Now, dramedy refers to a hybrid genre in which the dramatic logics of a one-hour serialized program are combined with elements of the situation comedy. The production of Ugly Betty was possible mainly because of the amount of economic, social, cultural, and sy symbolic capital deployed by the producers of the show, who pursued a project that had never been undertaken before, which is the adaptation of a Latin American telenovela into a dramedy for U.S. mainstream primetime broadcast television. As you can tell from this quote, sometimes the process of reformatting and adaptation includes modification to the narrative conventions at the core of the show. In this case, for example, it meant a shift in genre, from telenovela to dramedy, to make the show appealing to a broader audience not so used, perhaps, to telenovelas. The Latina and Latino production team in this creative process can be described as one of cultural translators. This term allows us to understand how Latina and Latino producers manage to build a cultural bridge to mainstream audiences while also luring bilingual Hispanic viewers to the show. The very role as cultural translators of the members of Betty's production team consisted of being able to de-Latin Americanize the series only to later U.S. Americanize it. Silvio Orta, a Latino, was assigned the task of translating the telenovela into a language that would speak to second and third generation U.S. Hispanic audiences that had grown up with a different cultural sensibility than their parents or grandparents, but were nevertheless familiar with the genre and the Latino culture. On the contrary, however, TV executives wanted to appeal to a broader audience beyond Latinos, which explains the construction of a sanitized Latinidad by mainstream media corporations. 
So overall, the adaptation of Ugly Betty for the U.S. market exemplifies the negotiations mentioned before and the efforts on the part of media producers and distributors to draw from local global content while simultaneously trying to localize a product enough to appeal to domestic viewers. The example discussed show how the processes of adaptation go beyond the purchasing of a license fee and its direct reformatting. Adaptation can include modification to genre and narrative conventions, the decision to air a program at a different time slot than the original time slot in the producing country, and as we will see in the next module, subtitling and dubbing can also be considered practices for cultural transfer and adaptation. So we will focus this week on the general concept of reformatting and in the following couple of weeks we're going to look at how translation and specifically subtitling and dubbing can be seen as well as a form of uh, reformatting. So the next three weeks are very um, closely related and I look forward to discussing them with you because this is really the core of what I studied um, at UCLA during my PhD and also uh, what I wrote in my dissertation and my book which we will read in this class. So I look forward to having this discussion with you.